deeper, depending on which forecast you listen to. Um, and what's it going to take to kind of come back? So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, you'll see there are some roles on the screen. We are going to keep everyone muted and video off uh, with the exception of our panel members. And we will be leveraging the chat function, which I will be mo uh, mo monitoring um, and try to get to your questions. Well, because of the format, we will address questions at the end um, of the session and we expect to go for about an hour today. Um, additionally, um, Taryn, if you can flip to the other slide, if you're not comfortable with Zoom and haven't used it a lot, there are some interesting features, there you go, um, that you can change how it's displayed. Um, hopefully most of you have all figured that out right now, but you can kind of play around with those boxes and you're um, either at the top of your screen or on the right, uh, so you can make it a better experience for yourself. Um, with that, we'll, we'll get started, and I'm uh, going to ask each of our panelists to give you a very brief uh, introduction of themselves, and we'll start with Adolfo. Hi, everybody. I'm Adolfo Candre. I'm the President and Executive Consultant for Digital, Digital Enablement Solutions. Um, before that, I was the Global Information Technology Leader for Michaelman Chemicals, um, a specialty chemical company based out of Blue Ash, Ohio. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, uh, Jonathan Towner. I've got uh, overall IT responsibility at Mazak Corporation. Uh, we are a global machine tool manufacturer uh, based down in Florence, Kentucky. Thank you, Joe Putnick. Hello, how are you? Uh, Joe Putnick, I'm with CBTS. Um, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for CBTS, and, and also CBTS is a company of Cincinnati Bell Telephone. Thank you, and Glenn. Did we lose Glenn? All right, he was having Glenn, some- Glenn, Glenn, Yeah, Glenn's speaking, but uh, it sounds like we still can't hear him. All right, so he's having some trouble with that, that iPhone technology stuff that's out there. <laughs> that's why there's none of that in my house. I know I'm an anomaly. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started and uh, hopefully Glenn will be able to pop back in here shortly. So recognizing that this is our new normal, um, for at least April and who knows how much longer. What are you guys seeing and that you are like, okay, we've gotten through the rush, we're, we're operating in whatever method that is, everybody at home, AB shifts coming in and out of the office, et cetera. What do you feel like you need to go back and address to smooth things out? And I'll start, Joe, I'll start with you from both a big company and from what you're seeing um, in the mid-tier marketplace. Well, that's a big question. So, you know, what we're seeing is, so we did A-B testing a long time ago um, and air gapping of our teams. And so we went to a strict work from home and uh, only critical infrastructure folks that are showing up to the office at this point. So of the 4,000 people with inside of Cincinnati Bell, there is roughly about 700 folks that can't work from home. The rest are uh, doing uh, A-B air gapping along the way um, in, in critical functions. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, what we're seeing our customers doing is actually then migrating as well, straight, strictly work from home. Um, so those are really the, 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 the two things that we're seeing with inside of our space. I think the other thing which is really interesting is continuing on with our business continuity process. So we as a provider um, of services, uh, critical services for this region, um, we have a dedicated team um, that does business continuity planning and then manage that process. And um, so we meet every day at one o'clock and continuing to do that. And so one of the things that we're now planning on, and we've got a couple of different work streams are <clears throat> what, the process for then migrating back into the office. So um, that's one of the things that we're working on um, since uh, we've now worked, started working from home. So what's the process to take the infrastructure that we brought home back into the office? How are we going to clean it? Are we just going to leave it in the, the uh, employees' homes um, and write that off? Um, you know, a couple other things that we're working on are uh, continuing to monitor the network capacity and uptime of the overall network. Um, over the last three weeks, we have seen massive amounts of capacity added to the network. Some of our customers is 5X 
um, for, for them to plan to work from home. And um, so, you know, as an example, we had a customer that had 2,000 concurrent calls in their network, um, and that was their steady uh, run state. And in order to, uh, to prepare to work from home, they had to up that to 10,000 concurrent calls uh, to route through their network so that they can accommodate uh, their remote employees. So that, that then increases the burden on the network as well. So I, I think the new norm is what are the new work streams that were created? And what are we doing to continue to monitor those from, from, a, uh, from a new failure mode analysis? Um, and, and that could take many different things. And you know, one of our customers um, was highly reliant on, um, they didn't roll out Teams or Skype, and they just kind of pushed everybody out the door and said, here's Microsoft Teams, uh, go, go use it uh, in, in the home. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that they started to realize is, well, we've never kind of looked at what's the failure modes around that and what's the backup for Teams at that point. So um, I'll, I'll kind of pass it off to the other panelists as well. Sure, uh, it's Jonathan. Um, we are actually one of those that um, you know had a very condensed rollout cycle for Teams. So, uh, you know, the week leading up to it, so we 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 had a few days notice, um, and luckily we had all the licensing and things like that in place. Um, but we did not get to do nearly the level of a controlled rollout of a new software package the way that you know I would have preferred to be able to do. Um, so we've been leveraging uh, you know the available training from Microsoft, directing folks to that. Um, but we do have to go back and do more of the governance piece. Um, you know, so we've, we rolled it out a little bit more locked down probably than we would have otherwise. Um, you know, we're keeping, uh, keeping users locked out from the ability to create teams, things like that, that, you know, we're keeping only to the IT staff at this point. Um, and then we'll go back and identify our super users and, and relax that a little bit, uh, you know, as we go forward. But for right now, you know, that was one example. Uh, we do have to go back and do some some more in in depth training um, for folks on the remote tools that we've put in place. Um, you know, we've also gotten a little bit more flexible than we thought we ever would with respect to monitors, desktops, and things like that that we've had people take home. Um, you know, so just making sure that we can support them, um, you know, bringing all of that equipment back in and getting it reset up uh, whenever the uh, the restrictions are lifted. So. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Also, what about from your side? Yeah, I, you know, I, I see a lot of parallels with what Jonathan was saying. Um, you know, when it really comes to that communication and that planning, uh, we really want to make sure that we're engaged with, uh, you know, our business partners and be clear as to what do we control and what's out of our control. Because we know a lot of times people will say, hey, Teams is slow or, you know, Skype or Zoom is slow or I'm having a bad experience. And really, it's something that's completely out of our control. It might be their home internet um, versus something that's within our ability to help them out. So we have to do a little bit of education there. Uh, again, you know, as we were saying, that, that communication and having those meetings about, all right, what's first level? Do we want to get these PCs back in that we've, that we've uh, put out to everybody? Um, security is huge, right? We see the articles coming in all the time that now ransomware um, is being disguised as COVID articles. So we want to make sure that we're educating the users to be careful about clicking on an article about some new research or something that shows promise. And really there's, you know, some ransomware hidden behind a PDF. So we want to make sure that they're aware to be careful on just clicking on anything. And then when it comes to the maturity of things like Teams, uh, at Michaelman, we were very early adopters of Teams. And one of the things that we found out and, and the advice that I've been giving clients is, as we've gone forward is really simplify your rollout of Teams, right? You really want to be able to hear somebody, uh, see the presentation, uh, and then the third piece is see the video. All of the other pieces of Teams those are add-ons that you can work on later, but really work on what your implementation is. So I think Joe's exactly right um, when he was saying, you know, that, that we want to take a look at it and plan that out, mature it, secure it, uh, especially if you've got an E5 with Microsoft. There's so many tools out there that they give you to help you protect that data, engage your right partner, and make sure that you've got that planned out the right way. Right. Uh, Glenn, did we get you back or are you still struggling? 
Oh, I think so. Can you hear me? Yep, we're good. Thanks. So how are okay, you guys? Good. A <laughs> services organization with lots of regulatory compliance. You probably had some additional concerns. Yeah, yeah I would echo a lot of what everybody else said. Um, you know, there's definitely, so we're regulated by the SEC. Um, and not indifferent from a lot of other regulatory agencies. Um, you know, there, there's been, our culture's always been in the office. It's not, you know, we've not really had a strong work from home culture. You know, it's, we see the value of everybody being in the office. We only have really one office location, even though we've got a lot of traveling people and things like that. Um, we've got, we're, we're pretty mature on the technology side though. And so this is, it's, it's actually been really nice to kind of, to show, you know, all the, the hard work that the IT team and, and our risk teams and cybersecurity teams and have put into place because we're, we're really operating really well. We're completely virtualized, virtual desktops. We put a lot of security things in place. Um, so as far as technology, we're, we're working really well. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad we chose WebEx and, you know, some other things we have in place. I'd say one of the, you know, the bigger learning lessons is training. You know, we, we've done, you know, business continuity um, scenarios, and we've done some training with the entire staff regarding that. Um, but with this, it's, it's more the longevity than it is the, the capabilities. You know, like, we're finding, like, you know, oh, everybody, everybody's great for working for a week or two weeks. Okay, now we're into the third week. Oh, wow, this is going to go on for two months. And so, you know, how do you train for that, that, that longer period? And for us, you know, the, everything's running very smoothly. I'd say the biggest deficiency, a lot of it's just the hardware, the printers, the scanners, um, things like that. And um, we have been beefing up the, the cybersecurity big time. You know, I saw that uh, uh, No Before, who does our cybersecurity training, they're, they're reporting a 667% increase in ransomware since the beginning of March, uh, which is massive. Um, so, you know, now, now you've just you've got to, you've opened up the doors with other people's internet connections, their PCs. Even though we, we really bundle all of our security and remote access with the virtual desktop, which is great, you're still having people access from many different devices and things like that. Um, when it comes to, the, uh, to get to the question, Tracy, you know, with regards to regulatory compliance and things, I think part of it, um, I'd say that one of the bigger things for us is the documentation as well. Um, we found that we need to document um, exceptions to the rule and things like that. So. Um, who's allowed into the office? Why are they allowed into the office? Um, we've made a procedural change, um, you know, things like that. Some of the, you know, we've looked at, uh, like Microsoft Teams, for instance. We're, we're using a, a WebEx and Jabber, and, and we're, we, um, we're, so we're, we're working really well with those things, you know, Jabber, and, and we've got the, uh, all the compliance and things in place for that. But we found that there was, um, you know, so we were looking at Microsoft Teams, things like that, where, you know, we can't just up and turn on Microsoft Teams because we have to archive all the instant messaging, the chats, and things like that. So there's a lot of compliance things that we just can't do. And so if there's exceptions to the rule, we need to make sure we document all those things. Um, so, you know, the documentation, one, the uh, training, I think is probably the biggest lesson for me to, you know, think like, you know, we really have got to train users on how to use these products a lot better. Um, and then the procedures, having backup procedures for a lot for certain things like like scanning. You know, people don't have scanners anymore. Okay, but we've got people taking pictures with their iPhone and scanning them in versus the mobile app. You know, there's there's some workarounds. Um, you know, some of the actual signing of physical signing of documents. We were trying to we didn't have a a, a docu sign in place for that. So um, how do you verify and, and sign some of these documents and things like that. So having some uh, documentation on um, exceptions to the, to the normal rules. Um, so I think, you know, the SEC would want to see this and, and, uh, and we need to make sure we document it as well. Great. Thanks. So to expand on that just a little bit, some of you kind of mentioned it already, but from a security perspective, did you already have multi-factor? Have you had to add it or, are you doing any additional training? Because like you said, some of these things are coming in tagged on to look like part of COVID or, or any of these other, you know, home, home systems didn't correct the, change the default password on their home router. What have you done with some of those things? So um, Jonathan, you're smiling pretty big. We'll start with you. 
Yeah, we've had to do more uh, more in-depth training, and we did that um, using that week before we officially put the policy out. So, um, you know, we held a number of in-person as well as web-based trainings, uh, given that our you know our workforce is geographically dispersed across the entire North American region. Um, and we luckily we already had MFA in place, um, but that was largely for the folks that traveled on a regular basis. So our field service teams, you know, our sales teams, they were all relatively comfortable with it. But the the folks that were primarily office, um, you know, office bound uh, roles, uh, never went through that process because we exempted you know known locations like our own uh, facilities from the MFA policy, so that they didn't have to do that while they were sitting at their desk every time. Uh, so there was a, a pretty steep learning curve there for the first, I'll call it two weeks of getting them through the MFA setup with Microsoft, um, you know, going through all of that, uh, putting VPN on desktops, um, you know, putting uh, IP communicators so the ability to have their desk phone on their, um, on their desktop at home, uh, just little things like that, you know, took a, an overwhelming amount of effort in that first week or so to, to really get that rolled out. But there was a ton of training um, involved in that. And, and did your team create that training? We did. Um, okay. You know, we, we took some documentation, you know, from Microsoft, some of the quick startup guides. Um, we took some training uh, documents from Cisco and kind of blended to more or less what we had in our configuration. Uh, so tried to, to keep that as, as simple as we possibly could um, with literally verbatim screen by screen. This is what you will see on the next screen. Yes, it's okay to hit next. Yes, it's okay to, you know, put your password in here. Um, you know, we've, um, over the past 12 months, we've gotten a lot more strength in our security programs, a lot more in the know before as well. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing that in our user base, they are becoming more skeptical of things, which is good. Um, so we had to, you know, kind of ease that, uh, that it's okay to click yes here. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's awesome. So I am going to ask some of the other panelists the same question, but I'm going to ask you one more, uh, Jonathan, because I know you did a lot of work uh, in your organization prior to all of this to redirect traffic to your help desk and make your staff more self-sufficient. Have you seen that help or have you seen a spike and had to jump in and what's, what's that done to your help desk support? Um, having that in place already was, was a huge help uh, because we were able to track everything much better. Uh, you know, we stopped a lot of the shoulder tap um, before this all came down. So, um, you know, our user base was relatively trained in the idea that if they need help, they send an email in. Um, and so whether they were able to, you know, do that from a, a corporate connection or a personal connection, if they were at home and, and couldn't get on the corporate environment, they were used to that, which allowed, you know, the, the help desk staff to really queue those up and address them in terms of priority. Um, so having that, you know, that ticketing based system in place was a tremendous help and getting the user base used to going through that as opposed to walking back to the IT group um, was also a, a huge help. Okay, awesome. So Adolfo, it's kind of the same questions from a security perspective. I believe a number of the folks you're working with are smaller organizations that probably don't have the, the breadth and depth uh, of systems and tools in place that, you know, Jonathan and Joe probably have in their companies. So what have you seen to help address the security and, and or new standards that had to be put in place? Yeah, I mean, you know, they don't have to be large companies to use some of the tools. I mean, we've, we've mentioned no before a few times already. Um, and I think it's a great tool and a great company uh, because they're not that expensive. And it's a great tool to use to really, I mean, I'm, I, I always say this and, I, and I, I make, you know, I don't, I don't hide the fact that I really champion that whole defying the um, the security and the education portion of uh, of security and know before is a great partner to use uh, because again they're not that expensive and they scale up and down depending on the size of your company to help people understand what's out there security basis and you can change it around depending on what's really out there um, but what you really want to do is get that message out there to everybody and try to educate uh, all users again you know we, we've spoken about Microsoft a lot um, but if you've got an E3 with Microsoft or you've got an E5 with Microsoft uh, there's a lot of tools already at your disposal that they're there uh, available to you if you're using Intune to control your devices uh, right there you've got a bunch of tools that are paid for and they're available to you day in and day out uh, multi-factor authentication is always hard to sell 
Um, but one of the things that I've always found that have really helped me out is uh, to try to sell to your executives and to your users families. And what I mean by that is if you turn around and you start talking to your users about how important security is for your business, it seems to go in one ear out the other. But if you start talking about these terms and how important it is to protect your bank account, or listen, you've got to be careful about, you know, just clicking on these emails or downloading PDFs when you don't recognize them because somebody could steal your information and then they got your ID and they can log into your bank account and hijack your bank account or your PayPal account. Suddenly people start worrying about that or letting your kids play on your iPad that then you use to log into your bank account. You want to have separate devices for that. As you personalize it a little bit, it starts clicking with people a little bit better. So as you give them something to appreciate on a personal level, they seem to then be able to bring that into the workplace a little bit better. So try to personalize the conversation and they seem to gravitate towards the tools better as well. All right, Joe, from your perspective, I, th I think you guys probably had a lot of security already in place and procedures. We, we do, um, you know, but I, I think, you know, the key at, that Adolfo was talking about and the other panelists were, you got to talk to your employees. So what we're running into and what we're also investigating right now is the password resets. So you, it's a little thing when you're in the office, but when you're on a VPN and you have folks that have never done it before and they're very skittish and now you have sales guys who are trying to continue to support their customers, um, it's a big deal. And um, so, you know, one of the things over the last two weeks that we found is what's a really 45 second video on how to walk somebody through how to, how to, change, your, how to change your password on a VPN. Um, what we found in, and I think it was Glenn said, um, I was talking to an employee who called me and goes, hey, uh, hey, guess where I'm at? And I said, I don't know, where are you? And he goes, well, I'm in the office. And I'm like, well, what are you doing in the office? And he was like, well, I'm changing my password. I'm like, you know, you could do this on the VPN. And there's, it, and so, you know, well, that sparked something within our own company because we had thought that we'd kind of lock things down. Well, what we didn't do is turn off access to non, non-essential employees into the facilities. So we actually then had to go and pay to have a, a, a cleaning crew go through on those floors that that individual swiped uh, to go change his password. And so, um, you know, I, what we're doing is talking to our employees because there's, there's little workloads that elude us, um, whether it's changing passwords, whether it's uh, requesting access. We had a couple of employees that didn't have access to WebEx, um, and it wasn't a big deal because they never needed it before. Well, the tool to do that is actually internal. It's an internal system that we use. Um, and so they need to get on the VPN. So little workloads like that um, are, are pretty critical from a security perspective and some of the statistic that was that we had given, but we're also uh, monitoring the, the network for uh, the really the city and the region. So we're seeing really bad actors. Um, there's a massive uptick on on trying to gain access into the networks um and so you know we've got our teams you know 24 7 365 continuing to um whack-a-mole on these bad actors and, and whether it's it's shutting down ip addresses or ip ranges or um you know working with uh the the federal government to, to actually let folks know what's happening inside the networks um you know we're constantly doing that so, um, you know, as Adolfo was speaking, one of the things I'd written down was you just really need to understand the employees, understand what they're going through, you know, have some type of informal network that gets funneled back in because th there could be someone in finance, you know, we're talking about, you know, doing payroll um, that um, they, that you may not even know a system was out there, for instance, and you need to take that in, into consideration. So. Um, that's kind of what we're doing. That's how we're adapting to the current environment. Um, you know, as you said, we had a lot of the tools in place to do that, but most of the employees weren't trained to do that either. So, um, you know, making sure that we're over communicating, I, I think is key. Great. So Glenn, anything unique there from your perspective? Oh, no, not really. I, I would like all, all the same things. You know, I think that, uh, 
it's it, it's been nice to see that a lot of the things we had in place are, are really coming to fruition in, in, in this. You know, I uh, you know I, I tout the virtual desktops huge, um, containing everything into a virtual desktop. All the applications are in a virtual desktop. You know, if if we we have dual factor authentication put in there, we got well basically all the <laughs> security bells and whistles you can get. Um, so that's it's nice we have all that in place. You know, if, if people, you know, with, with the BYOD, if people lose their device, doesn't matter. It's all it's all virtualized. Um, so in, in this scenario, that's worked really well. I think you know we, we've we've beefed up the security a bit as far as um, I mean the, the training. So we've uh, we, we created a. I'd agree with Adolfo. I think it's it's personalizing it a little bit more, um, putting you know standing out the. Uh, the work from home issues. So what we did is we had our CISO create a, a personalized video um, for Ball and Gainer and, and more, you know, more specific to the Ball and Gainer thing. So we did a personal 17 minute, minute video, sent that out. And it was really all around work from home. So how to, sec you know, going through how to secure your Wi-Fi and, and, you know, not, you know, physical things like not having your kids on that, on the same PC and, and all those things. So I think the um, customizing it, for the customizing training for ball and gainer and specifically with work from home issues i think was really good i've, I've just i sent a lot of personal emails out, you know, i've been sending personal emails out to almost everybody in the company hey how are you doing how's everything going reaching out to people and and you know really you know kind of managing from you know you know i try and manage from walking around the office well you know, i'm doing that just maybe email or calling people randomly and saying how are things going and and, uh, so, and really hitting home, I just sent some random emails, just, you know, the, the thing I always just stress all the time is, you know, it, email is still the biggest concern. It's getting, the, you know, a malware, ransomware via an email from a link or an attachment and just, you know, hounding it that, uh, you know, don't click on anything unless you're expecting it. And um, so our, our users get it. You know, they're pretty advanced. So I think just um, I agree with Adolfo personalizing it. Um, has been basically our basically our, our full thing. Our um, we've got a, a cyber risk committee that um, happens to manage you know manages the cyber security, but it also manages business continuity, um, disaster recovery, um, insurance, and we're the committee that's managing this whole um, the whole work from home and the whole you know the business pieces of this. You know how long we're going to be staying at home and all the policies in place for that. So we've been meeting at least weekly, um, probably you know, probably more like you know two to three times a week with updates. So I think that's been really good to get our whole entire committee on a uh, you know WebEx call and, and meeting weekly to, to keep up on things. Okay, great. So so keeping with our what's what's the new normal look like and going forward? Um, and Jonathan, I'm going to start with you because you you brought this to light when we were all chatting as our prep. How do you take advantage of the good things that you're seeing come out of this? You know, there, there's some things that are definitely been positive. So how do you identify those and figure out how to keep them in your business? Sure. Um, and I think that's obviously going to depend, you know, business to business as to where they kind of are on a digital transformation curve. Um, you know, being a traditional Midwestern manufacturer, uh, we're a little bit behind that curve comparatively, I'm sure, than some others, uh, certainly on the panel and others that are uh, in the participation. But um, we had a ton of processes that were very paper-based. Um, you know, a lot of processes that ended with a, a folder full of papers that moved from one desk to the next. Um, and so, you know, by training the users that they can change that out queue from paper to PDF and, you know, wrap that up into a digital workflow, um, and it actually works, was a, a tremendous uh, gain that we've seen, you know, through this process. Um, and so, once we start to kind of come back into the office, making sure that we continue those processes uh, so that you've got, you know, the digital, digital paper trail that you have versioning and things like that, that, you know, you don't have in traditional paper process uh, is going to be a, a big benefit to us. Um, you know, it's, it's a very unfortunate way to make advancements, but, um, you know, I think you got to find the silver lining in, in everything. And, um, you know, that's specifically one of them. Uh, the other one I think is, you know, the, the elevation of the IT groups within a business from being seen as a, a back office, uh, you know, keep the green lights uh, green and blinky to a true business enabler, uh, I think is something that we all need to strive to, to take advantage of um, on the out, uh, you know, the out path of this um, and really start to assume those roles of, of being a strategic partner to the business. Um, 
you know, it was nice to see that as we went through this, how much more, you know, IT was involved in the planning and strategy sessions on how we're going to handle these things going forward um, was a nice, uh, a nice benefit to have. So I think those two things, looking at process by process, you know, what you can take and keep the efficiencies even when you're back in the office, and then the elevation of IT within the organization itself uh, are two tremendous things that I'm, I'm looking forward to, to taking advantage of as we go forward. Yeah, I have to agree. I, that's one in a lot of the conversations I've had over the last couple of weeks that that elevation of IT is clearly coming into play. Now we have to make sure that it, it stays there, it doesn't slide backwards. Right. Um, Joe, what, what are you seeing from either internal to your organization and or what you're hearing from the field and your, your clients who are representative of the members on this call? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the, the key points that was brought up was that elevation game and making sure that you're in the forefront of the planning side and really having the business look at you as, as being essential, I, I think is, uh, is something that is really unique. Uh, but, and, and not, you know, shoving it in folks' face, but just be, being there to be the consultant and, and partner uh, with them, I think, is really key. Um, you know, one of the other things I think this is highlighting for our entire organization, um, because we've got assets from Hawaiian Telecom to, you know, every province in Canada, is just truly the unique nature of, um, you know, uh, you can operate without borders, you can operate multi-time zones, um, the technology exists to uh, facilitate teams um, and, and really have a, a diverse uh, pool of resources working on projects. It takes a little bit longer. Um, you know, I, I just ran a scrum session just right before this for a new solution we're working on. And, you know, it literally, it, for me, I'm the type of guy that, hey, okay, let's start to work on a project, right? Like 10 minutes introductions and then let's go. Well, what I found was it took literally a half an hour for everyone to meet. And, uh, you know, I, I personally, am like, I, I grew impatient. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, we're not going to get through this in time. So to take a little bit of, uh, to relax a little bit, um, I think that's what we're learning. I think we're learning to um, listen a little bit more than, than talk. Um, and, you know, I think for our employees, um, you know, really understanding what's happening inside the, the home, right? And, and, and I think the, the biggest benefit that's going to come out of this is it's really humanizing the work, the workforce, right? Um, you know, you're, you're in my home. Um, you know, I've got 115 plus people uh, that didn't know me before. And now you can probably see my kids up on the wall there. So um, I think that's what we're also seeing. Um, and then, you know, really understanding um, boundaries. So, you could spend, in, in, uh, probably everyone that's on this call could spend 20 hours a day working, but that's not realistic in the long run. So how do you put those boundaries in place? Um, how do you set up a work environment? How do you turn off the light, leave the desk, and leave work? That's, I think that's another thing that we're finding. Um, and we were, like I said, I was working with a gentleman in Phoenix, and he was like, hey, look, for this, for this uh, scrum uh, team, let's not do meetings until uh, 10 o'clock your time. And we're like, 10 o'clock, like, oh my goodness. He was like, well, yeah, I'm in Phoenix. And we're like, oh, we didn't even know you're in Phoenix. So um, so those are some of the, the, the unique things that we're seeing. Uh, I think the other thing that we're talking about here is the network, the, the transformation of, of IT allows that to happen. And a lot of folks didn't even think about that, to, to be honest with you. Right, um, and so we're seeing the the value of the dollars that we're putting into our companies um, are coming to light as well. I think that's actually quite quite interesting, um, and uh, we know we're not seeing that across the board. Where you know there are some folks that can't work from home. Um, we've got a bunch of, like I said before, we've got about uh, 700 or so folks that have to go into the office or have to be on trucks or have to be out in the field fixing things but the back half don't um, and, and really communicating effectively across that is what we're seeing. So I'm gonna continue and kind of go to Glenn next. Similar vein, but one of the things that came up, Glenn, you commented that your corporate culture was one that everybody wanted to be, you felt you needed to be in the office. Well, now they're not. You fortunately were set up technically to be able to do that. What do you think is gonna happen when this is over to, uh, Amy posted a question, which was kind of my straight man question in two of ours, we were going to go next. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, I think some people are going to keep this work from home strategy, but
but then others are going to say, no, you really do need to be in the office. So as Jonathan put it on our prep call, how do you unring that bell? So Glenn, I'll start with you and then I'll jump to Adolfo and, and Jonathan. We lose Glenn again. No, he's on mute. Oh, I think he's probably stuck on mute right now. Um, Jonathan, you go ahead and start, and I'll step away and see if I can fix that. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be we're going to end up in a more of a hybrid model um, when we come back. You know, I don't know that we're going to end up in a situation where we're purely remote or purely in the office anymore. I think it's going to force that flex time that's kind of always been. Um, an idea out there, but uh, you know, now that we've proven that it can work in a remote environment, I think you're going to see a lot more requests for folks to have that sort of, maybe it's a, you know, one or two days a week from home or, uh, you know, uh, you know, as Joe was talking about humanizing the, the workforce, you know, my kid's got a performance today, I'm going to work from home, I'm going to go catch that performance and then be back online. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more, you know, flexible schedules versus purely, you know, purely remote or, or purely working from the office. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, at Michaelman, you know, I mean, it was almost two years ago that I was part of the flexible workplace uh, team, but we did a huge study, you know, as an international company, how do we, do we enable, you know, people to work remotely? Do we support this? And one of the things that we found Right. And uh, and Joe was mentioning, right, was we've got a certain degree of the population that can't work remotely. Right. They have to be in. So one of the big things that we found is it can't be a policy. And, and we're all going to go back into the office and we're all going to immediately get, you know, we're going to sit down at the table and there's going to be a big, big conversation about creating a policy about working from home. How do we, the leaders are going to want to be rigid about this. And what we found was you don't want to create a policy because it's it's going to be guidelines that you want to create because some people aren't going to be able to some people are uh you're going to have issues where part of the team has to be on site to work certain parts of their jobs but then other parts of their jobs they can and it's going to be up to managers discretion right you're going to get some of the business leaders like cfos are immediately going to monetize this and go wait but if we've got people working from home, that means that I can have a certain uh, amount of the population who no longer has to be in the office, which means now instead of needing a building for 800 people, I could have a building for 400 people, which means that we can save money on rent, which now, that, and they're immediately gonna start thinking about it that way, right? So now we need to sit down and go, all right, well, can we use some of this money to reinvest into the technologies to strengthen our ability to support this, right? Uh, you're going to have CEOs that immediately, we have to keep in mind, when we sit down and we get back in the office, one of the first questions that we're going to get asked is, okay, how do we ensure that this never happens again? Or that we're prepared for when this happens again, that we're able to seamlessly transition into something, you know, into remote workplace, into, you know, supporting all of our employees so that productivity isn't lost. So we have to prepare our conversations now to be able to support that and move into that, that type of discussion, right? So all of these things are the, the next generation. This is the conversation, the workflows that we have to get into. So I don't know if I kind of moved this into a tangent there. No worries, thanks. So Glenn, I think we got you back. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> um, I, I would echo uh, Jonathan's comments on, um, you know, we, there's a, a big part of our office that's been paper. So, you know, redoing a lot of the, 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 those processes. We're, you know, we're an investment firm, so there's lots of forms and things that need to be physically signed. Um, so looking at, you know, ways to um, you know, change a lot of those, those type of processes with the dig digital signature, looking at um, adopting process flow into our uh, – um, document management solutions and, and, and things like that. So really looking at some of our, you know, more of the physical type processes. Um, as far as our, our culture, like I said, you know, we're, our, our culture has been, you know, coming to the office, work eight to five, you know, and I think that, um, but, you know, we've got our CEO, our, our chairman, our, our, we've got a big remote workforce um, that, you know, between me and the other 40 people on here, I have managed to, you know, it's been a top priority for me to support all of these people and the, the way a lot of the things that we've done have, have kind of gone hand in hand so 
you know, I have always touted security as the number one reason for me doing a lot of the different things that we've done. It's, you know, we're a, a firm that deals with securities, investments. So security is number one, always. And then, you know, then, you know, the reliability and then functionality and, and the list kind of goes down. But I found that the security, the business continuity, the disaster recovery, the remote access, all these things kind of go in hand in hand and kind of go down in that line. So when we're looking at that things, I've been able to kind of go around, you know, for a certain, that's why go around management to, to put it into the back end and get some, you know, get supported by the management with things. But by, by putting all the virtual desktops in the security around that and all these things, we were set up really good for this, this thing. As far as the culture goes, um, I think things are going to shift. I think we're going to see a pretty big shift. I think that going back into the office is going to be more of a gradual thing. I don't think it's going to be like, bam, we're all back in the office. I think this is going to be more of a gradual thing. I don't think that uh, some people are not going to feel comfortable. God forbid if we have somebody in the office that gets a virus or gets sick, I think it's, it's going to loosen up and we're going to, and we're going to find that, you know, things have worked so well. I mean, not tooting my own horn, but, you know, I probably got more accolades and more positive feedback during this than my prior 20 years at Bowling Gator. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been, it's been great, you know, and it's nice to see those positive things because we are working so well. And I think because things are working so well, people are going to be more open. The management is going to be more open to be more flexible with people working from home. And we've proven that we can do it now and creating some efficiencies to make sure that people can do it. Um, so I think we're going to see a shift. I think this is going to be a shift across the board, not just at Ball and Gainer, but other companies that uh, working from home, it's, you know, it's going to be more of a, um, you know, they're going to see some of the advantages to it, not just the, as a negative. So, and so we'll, we're going to be, be preparing for that, you know, and then, and creating better, you know, training and the processes, I think are the two areas where I see the, uh, the most work to, that needs to happen when we get back to the office. All right. Thanks guys. So we'll take a couple of the questions that came up in the chat, and then we'll wrap up with one final question for all of you. Um, so one of the questions is, um, moving to zero trust network architecture, what are your thoughts on this approach? I don't know which one of you might have some thoughts or. Uh, I, I, I'd love to jump in on that real quick. I mean, so we, we actually do sell um, multi or uh, zero trust networks um, in the full architectures. Um, there's some folks that are on, um, the chat, uh, I kind of scrolled down and see who, who actually joined. Some of those are our partners that actually uh, help um, our, the customer base actually uh, deploy those and architect those as well. Um, so you know, we have a couple of different solutions in our portfolio in the communication space, uh, whether it's our, our NAS portfolio um, or SD-WAN portfolio that attach into Zero Trust Networking um, as well. So. Um, we, we have seen that um, you, those terms, um, for the most part, I've seen in the fairly, you know, mid-market to large enterprise, not into mid-market into SMB. Um, but, you know, when you think about it, um, it, the democratization of that technology is in place. So um, those things scale down to a single office you know, 20, 20 people, 10 people, all the way up to multi-thousand, um, you know, employees. So that's something that um, I would encourage you to take a look at because it then it, it encompasses the entire wrapper of, of uh, devices. So not only mobile, uh, not only tablets, the PCs, um, if you're doing any type of, of desktop, uh, remote desktop or virtual desktop, um, it has it in there as well. Um, you can add in two-factor authentication on top of that, um, and it really secures not the, the entire environment, um, not just the physical locations. So what you've seen now is people take, took home their laptops. If, if you're Office 365, there's no reason to connect to the corporate network on a VPN. Um, you know, if you're Salesforce, there's no, there's no need to connect to the VPN. However, that traffic is not going across your corporate network anymore. And um, so we were talking about some bad actors that are out there and, and malicious links that are out there that would help protect that as well. So I do think it is a valid architecture. I think that folks are investigating that. Um, we haven't seen um, that tipping point uh, with inside of our customer base collectively that have adopted. 
um, zero trust architectures at this point. Um, if you go back about three years ago, the cost to do them was was pretty large. Um, that has come down in scale. So that that could be something that as we go forward, um, with inside of the next uh, couple of years, uh, folks would be potentially adopting. Okay, thanks. So another question that came across is how are, how are each of you handling man in the middle attack concerns? Uh, so for us, for Mazak, we've um, we've done a lot of that with the education around no before and, and going through and, and teaching people to recognize, you know, variances in speech patterns, things like that, that would be things that would alert you in the bodies of the emails. We've also done, um, you know, alerts based on tagging uh, anything from a non mazak domain with an external line on the subject of emails. Um, you know, the we have a, a red piece of text that comes across the top of the email that says that the um, you know, the, the sender of this email is different than the reply to. So little visual cues and things to look for to where, you know, if you're expecting that to be an internal to internal communication, and all of a sudden you're going to have some things that are visual cues in those email strings that are going to alert you that somebody else may be there. Um, you know, but it's been a, a combination of training with some little technical additions along the way. Okay. Great. So we're getting close to the end. So kind of our one of the last questions I wanted to get some feedback from each of you is have you started your plans and what does it look like to go back? So eventually we'll come out of a stay at home order. Um, you know, it's been mentioned that, you know, folks were carrying monitors out of the office because they wanted multiple screens at home. So do you have them bring them back? Do you sterilize them? Do you stage how they come back? Um, you know, let, let's kind of go there. So Jonathan, you were talking last, so we'll let you start first and then we'll roll through uh, Adolfo, then um, Glenn and we'll end with Joe. Sure, you know, those plans are still kind of under development at this point. Uh, we don't have it fully defined, um, but we, we certainly plan to go through some level of sterilization on equipment that they've taken home. Um, we still have a, a large presence in the office as well. Um, so, you know, we, we haven't gotten to uh, to those things because we are deemed an essential business supplying medical um, and other critical industries. So um, as those things get more defined, yes, we will have a definitive plan in place for what you've taken home and how you bring that back in, um, you know, combined with obviously a significant ramp up in our, our sanit uh, sanitization processes in the office. You know, things are being wiped down much more often and much more frequently they, than they were um, you know, the, the physical separation of space in the office will continue for quite some time as well. So. Interesting, okay. Adolfo, what are, you, what are you seeing from your folks? Yeah, I, I have a, a couple different uh, clients that run, you know, different areas of the spectrum. So one of the clients, um, you know, patient care, and for them, they've been very, very particular about their employees, right, taking care of their employees, especially because they've got employees that then, deal with um, staff that you know handle patients directly so they've been very cautious about that and what they said was those people that have taken equipment home and, and monitors you know and, and peripheral devices just leave those at home if they ever leave the company they'll bring them back but it's you know a couple hundred dollars for a monitor it's really not going to cost us that much uh, we've had other ones that say yeah they'll, they'll bring them back and when they come back we'll we'll buy new ones and then I've got another one who's about to do a hardware refresh. So for them, they said, don't worry about it. We'll wrap it up into the hardware refresh costs and we would have disposed of them anyway. So we'll, it's, it's not a really a big deal for us. Now with business turndown, I don't know how that'll end up going. If they'll change their minds in a couple months, they weren't expecting this to last this long. So it's, it's run kind of the gamut of, uh, of decisions at this point. I think it depends on your industry. Uh, you know, a lot of the same things that Jonathan and Adolfo uh, said. It, you know, we, we haven't really got a good game plan yet. You know, we've got a little bit of time here as far as, yeah, we, we've we've made exceptions. You know, one thing we've, we've had it put in place is a really good BYOD policy. And, you know, people, we, we did a lot of testing beforehand um, to make sure that people had all the access that they needed. So we've done a BCP. Uh, test. We made sure everybody, you know, make sure they can test their virtual desktop. Can they get on? Can they get all the applications 
Did they have everything they need to work? So we did that test beforehand. That was definitely very valuable. Um, so we haven't had a lot of equipment go out, but we've had some. We've given some, you know, you know the biggest complaint, the, the dual monitors and printers and scanners. That's our biggest thing. Um, so we've let some monitors go out. We've got travel laptops, things like that. So I think we will need to um, um, I think we lost you again, Glenn. Yeah, I think it's a uh, timeout happened there. Um, if, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll pick up here. Yep. Um, you know, one of the things that we see in studying history is that these potentially come back in waves. So you may have a, a second or third wave. So one of the things that we're doing is is not being overzealous and, and bringing everybody back at one time. So it, it will be a systematic process as we bring folks back. Um, and we'll make sure that some of those assets stay uh, just in case. Um, you know, we um, also, so we started running this pandemic um, the first week of February, because as we started to look across the ecosystem, uh, especially coming out of China, we're like, look, this is going to happen, this is going to hit, and we need to be prepared. So we stood up our pandemic uh, uh, plan the first week of February. And so we started doing air gapping and a bunch of things back then to make sure that we could sustain the network and our customer base. And um, so um, I, I think Glenn had just mentioned this, but you got to continue to exercise those plans. You have to. Um, and you have to be forward thinking enough, uh, and enough being in this case, we were probably two or three weeks ahead of most folks. Um, that actually implemented it. We had a customer actually start theirs um, January 28th, as a matter of fact. So um, those are really some key things that we're doing about how to bring folks back. I think one of the other things that we also need to keep in mind is the risk of doing anything in this environment today is way higher. Um, you know, even changing customers' passwords or, or employees' passwords is way higher because if things fail, then they have to bring, they have to come back and actually join the network in order to actually gain access um, in certain cases. So, uh, doing projects, um, there's a much higher risk, um, and you need to kind of slow things down and make sure that you have uh, all of the risk factors and mitigation factors as low as possible. And in certain cases, you may have to delay. Um, new uh, new things because the risk factor is just too high. Uh, I know that we have collectively done that. So we were talking earlier about some network speeds. We've we've got a change freeze like it's Christmas time <laughs> within our within the entire environment. So we go on change freeze uh, starting November 15th through January 15th, and for certain times we actually have extended that past the Super Bowl with some of our bigger customers. So. Um, you know, some of the folks that we have um, typically working on some of those projects and, and working on uh, new things, um, they're now taking a little bit more time to go back and document and make sure that the risk mitigation is as low as possible if we have to do new projects. So those are some of the things that we're working on to make sure that we ensure the stability of the network, stability of the customer base that's, that, that we're uh, responsible for. And, um, and and really taking care of our employees as well. Thank you. So um, we're at the end of our time today. I wanna to thank all of you for participating and join us today. I'm hopeful that you got some additional insights into what folks have done to get to this point and how we're gonna move forward. Um, I know I, I took some interesting things away that uh, training is a key issue that everybody's going to talk about. Uh, uh, security folks were thankfully in a much better spot than most thought about, uh, but there's always more to do there and new things to look out for. And then working proactively on not only how we come back, but how we get prepared for another wave of this that may come later in the year. So uh, thank you all for joining us. For those of you that made it all the way to the end, we really appreciate it. Uh, and we look forward to being able to get together in one way or another and provide some additional of value and insight to each of you down the road. So everybody have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.